right? When Jesus healed the impotent man, um, and uh, that's for lack of a bad, better word, but the Bible does say it's impotent. Uh, the impotent man on what? The Sabbath day. Right. And hold on. In fact, let me uh, pull up that scripture here so I won't be just quoting from the top of my head here. So I got my you scripture. Good, mama. Right. Don't feel hey, don't feel rushed by any means. It's chill. You I know, I know. It, it, it's my behind because I came in here late and I all that other stuff. So it's kind of throwing me off just a little bit. Um, but We're happy you made it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, look at what it says right here. Let's go uh, to John chapter five. If you can, uh, dis uh, if I don't know if you have screen share, if you can display uh, the scriptures, if you don't mind. Um, what's your name, Marlo? Um, uh, okay. So uh, I, while you, uh, uh, if you if you're doing that, but I'll just go ahead and breeze through this here. So again, uh, I'm gonna start at here at John chapter five, verse six. I ain't gonna read all of this because this is a long story, but I'm gonna point out some key points here. It says when Jesus saw him lying, right? He was lying there uh, by the pool, and he knew that he had been there a long time. In that case, don't worry, I'm in the KJV. He saith unto him, "Wilt thou be made whole?" And the impotent man, so the Bible does use that word, and answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step down before me. So we now we know what the problem is. Jesus says here, Jesus saith unto him, rise and take up thy bed and walk. You don't need no water. You don't need no physical. I'm here. I'm your healing. And walk. And immediately the man was made what? Whole. No law was in in between this situation. And he took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was what? The Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now, right here, Jesus is doing work right here. What kind? Now, I, huh? Because. Hold, I, hold, hold, hold on real quick, Wesley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus is doing work on the Sabbath. He's doing something on the Sabbath. And he told this man to take up his bed and walk. Now, hold on. We all know that the Messiah, out of anybody in the biblical text, knows the law in and out, in and out, in and out. Why? Because he's the law giver. Okay? So he knows this 100%. But does it ring in people's mind? Wait a minute. He's telling this man to do a work, to take up his bed and walk. And Jesus is doing work too. But hold on, I'm not done. Let's go down here a few, because like I said, I don't want to go through all of this because this is a long story. The Jews, therefore, I'm jumping down to verse 10, says the Jews, therefore, said unto him that was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to take up thy bed. But Jesus told this man to take up his bed and walk. So according to the Jews, this was unlawful. According to the Jews, they are accusing Jesus and this man, subliminally, of what? Breaking the Sabbath because they're pointing out the Sabbath. Now, hold on. Let me give you one more. Watch this. Look at what Jesus says. Right up in here. Hold on. Give me a second. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place right now. Um. Jesus quotes something right here regarding him and the father. Look at verse 17. He says this, I'll start at 16 for context. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to what? Slay him, to kill him because he had done these things on what? The Sabbath day. So it is not us Christians that are accusing Jesus of breaking anything. No, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath. He can do whatever he wants to do on the Sabbath. But look at what else Jesus says here. It goes further. But Jesus answered them. He says, my father worketh hitherto and so do I. God never stopped working. It was when he said what he said in Genesis chapter, I want to say Genesis chapter uh, two, when he said that all things are good and he done, you know, everything has been created, man, the earth and all this other stuff. Everybody should know the Genesis story, right? He said what? I'm going to rest. 
Why? It's not resting saying that I'm resting and I'm I, I'm not doing in no longer doing any work. He's telling you that he is finished. He's done a finishing work. There's nothing else here to do. And so again, people get that confused as if God just stopped completely working. Well, let me throw a buzz in your ear. I want you to think about something. Everybody on this panel and everybody in the chat and all who are listening. If God truly stopped working altogether, period, do you realize that all life will cease to exist? Do you realize that we will die? The sun wouldn't shine. The moon wouldn't be the moon. The earth wouldn't hold up. No, we all know that God upholds everything and he keeps everything moving. So God is still working regardless of the fact when he made that quote in Genesis chapter, uh, I want to say Genesis chapter two, verses one and two, God is saying, I'm done. I've done my work. I'm finished. He's not saying I completely stopped working. No, we can clearly see God, the son, God, the father is still working even on the sabbath day that's point one and point two it was not christian believers who accused jesus of breaking anything or being sinful it was the jews that accused jesus of breaking the law and being in a sinful manner that's where the blame deserves to be okay real quick let me jump in now real uh west blaze you said uh you seem like you wanted to respond to something that she was saying in the midst of her dialogue did you want to go ahead and say that now yeah i'll try to make it quick just that there's there's a couple definitions there we got to get into you talked about god's labors ceasing in the uh the creation week that in six days he created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them and on the seventh he rested and that there are still things that god never stops working i got your point there however it, it does say that god rested from his creative labors that he stopped creating on that day and so that was the kind of work that god ceased for the seventh day rest that he labeled as the Sabbath well before there was ever a Jew or a Gentile, right? And then when when God gives the commandment, here's something that's really important that I, I feel like a lot of people miss, that in Exodus 20 verses eight through 11, God gives the commandment for the Sabbath day. He says, remember the Sabbath day, six days shall you labor, uh, seventh, keep it holy, right? You, you do no work on the seventh day. The word that was defined for, I'm sorry, the word that was translated to work Right there is uh, malaka, malak, something to that effect in Hebrew. And the word is defined as um, occupational labor. The word is defined as labor that basically you get paid for. You're clocking in and out. It's your vocation. It's your job. And that is the kind of work because today we have, we still have the same spirit of the Pharisaical rabbis that rejected Yeshua, that Jesus went around having those conversations with constantly where they were feuding and where Jesus said, you guys have forsaken the commandment of God for your own traditions. And after the commandments of men, you worship me in vain. He says these things because they did they had developed their own extra extra outer barrier of rules that they surrounded the law of god with and um that they they held up the law of god as if that's what they were preaching but then really when it came down to enforcing these things like the sabbath they would go around telling people you can't walk and, and carry your your mat you can't carry your bed well is that occupational labor was it anybody's job to, was it that man's job to be a bed carrier that he clocked in for and clocked out to get a paycheck that's not the definition of, of breaking the Sabbath. So to break the Sabbath would be to to buy or to sell or to, to perform occupational labor or cause others to do so. And so, yes, the, the Jews that were there, those Pharisees that were always threatening and, and um, you know, feuding with them, they accused him of breaking the Sabbath. I didn't get whether, Ms. Cherry, when in that conversation or in your, your dialogue there, were you saying that you agreed with them? I, I didn't gather that necessarily, but it, there was some confusing language. Do you think that that Jesus broke the Sabbath commandment, transgressed the commandment given for it, or or not? No, he can't break the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. You're you're, miss, you're missing that part. Again, look look at what you just said it within your statement that six days you should do uh, your work and be what finished. You should be done. God did a finishing work back in Genesis. Christ did a finishing work, what? On Calvary. It's done. What else is there to do if something is finished? Answer that. What else is there to do in the context of what exactly? Are you saying why, why should we continue to try to keep the commandments of God 
in the law of Moses, if Jesus said it is finished no, no, because no, no, of no, what no. he did? That's not what I said. I'd love to clarify. No, no, no. Listen to what I said. Okay. God okay. did a finishing work in the beginning, right? In okay. the beginning was the word. The word was, you know, not the, uh, not the, not John 1, 1, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the faces of the water, yada, 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 and let us make man in our own image, yada, yada, yada. God made the firmness from the firmness in everything, right? And in Genesis chapter two, what does God say he did? He, he finished. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what after that is left to do? Well, the rest of the story. No, 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 no. Well, who what's left for who to do in what, what sense? after God created the heavens and the earth? After God did the firmaments from the firmaments, after God created man, right? And the cattle and the beast and the, all that stuff, right? What was left to do? Well, let me, let me jump in. Let me jump in because that's part of the format. Part of the format was that if one person from the other side has a question, both can jump in. And Brian, whenever you want to, Bubba, just let me know and uh, you'll have the floor. Um, okay. um, but so I would argue, yeah, that um, the language in Genesis is exclusive to creation. So the question is, is what is he still creating things? Is he still creating universes? Is he creating a different life form on some other planet somewhere? Now, you know, that's going to bleed off into the discussion of cosmology and whatnot. But as it pertains to the context of Genesis 1 to bleed off into Jubilees, if you consider that uh, divinely inspired, um, that's the type of work. And so real quick, because I'm going to there's something else I want to elaborate on because it has everything to obviously to do with what we're talking about. So the idea of labor, that that's the question. What type of labor, right? What, what exactly does the Torah state about Sabbath observance and what does it not state, right? Now we know that labor was prohibited, but what type of labor? I'm going to argue as uh, West Blaise did, um, vocational labor. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, Peter was a fisherman. Yeshua was a carpenter by trade. Now, I don't find any verses indicating that they engaged in their occupational trade and received a wage on that day, right? And as far as I know, the Torah does not prohibit performing miracles on Shabbat, right? The Torah doesn't uh, prohibit gleaning from somebody else's field on, on Shabbat to get a snack either, as far as I know, yeah? So that's the question. Like, when he says that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, what exactly does he mean? Because when I, for instance, that word kyrios in the Greek, okay, we know that Paul says what? Um, Sarah, Sarah respected Abraham so much she called him Adoni, right? Or kyrios, Lord. So what exactly is a Lord? Now, when I, in my studies, when I look at the preponderance of what scripture has to say about just that term Lord, because it's not exclusive to an individual, you know, Christ had counterparts that were called Lord. Yah is called the Lord. He's called the sovereign Lord. But as far as I can tell, the office of lordship, it represents, you might say, one managing domestics, right? Be it citizens, uh, a territory, even material belongings of value stored in a particular area. But the word in and of itself does not include with it full autonomy to do whatever you want, right? So Abraham was, was Sarah called Abraham Lord, okay? So he was her Lord. But does that give him the authority to tell her to break God's commandments just because he's her Lord? Right. What exactly does Christ mean when he says that I am the Lord of the Sabbath? Is he using that phraseology in a context to suggest I'm the Lord of the Sabbath? So party it up, baby. You can do whatever you want. The word Lord there means master. Let's, yeah. Let's, master. Look, at, go ahead, let's Brian. look at the let's look at that text. Uh, let's actually go back. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's go to the Matthew one. Uh, Matthew. Uh, is it 11, 28, where he says. And why in the word is that? Basically, what I'm saying is the word Lord in that text, it means rule over. He he is the ruler over the Sabbath day. And basically what he's saying, he could do what he wants to on the Sabbath because it was given to him because all authority was given to him on earth. And then he and it's he is an ink blonde. But in Genesis, uh, in Genesis two, that word uh, Sabbath. Is actually uh, uh, God uh, finishing. In other words, God is uh, basically Adam and Adam and Adam was in perfect harmony with God before the fall. This means he was in permanent rest, not a temporary rest like the one day Sabbath. 
He was in rest. May okay. I say this? May I drag Go it for back? it, Terry. Go for it. I want us to deal with that word finish. We need to deal with that word finish. Because right. what does finish mean? It means done, completed, accomplished, fulfilled, right? Over. Ain't nothing right. else to do. And God says this clearly in Genesis chapter two. Uh, I want to say verses because uh, I got it up here. Uh, one and two. And he says right here, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. What else is there to do with uh, his work? which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made everything is done so again god is not harping on saying well i'm gonna go to sleep i need rest i need to regenerate i'm <laughs> out of energy no because god doesn't run out of energy he he's all powerful right can we all agree that god is all powerful omniscient omnipresent omnipotent right he's omnipotent right which means all powerful so all powerful don't need to sleep all powerful don't need to re uh, re energize, right? Because he's all powerful. Again, God is not saying I'm going to sleep. God is not saying I need to re energize. God said, I have done all the work I have completed. I have finished. I have accomplished everything. There's nothing else to be done. So, so, but my response, Cherry, is that he, he finished his creative work. So that's what I said, right? Like he's not he's not making other universes. I'm saying that when he's saying the word finish, that it's within the context of his creative works. It's not, I'm just gonna sit here on the throne and not do nothing ever, ever, ever. No, again. no, 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 no. I didn't say that. Okay. Because look at what Jesus said in John chapter five, verse 17. Okay. He says that I my father work and I work of hitherto. I work too. So again, yes, who's up causing the sun to shine? Just answer my question. Well, the most high, of course. Who causes us to have breath in our body? The most high. Who woke us up this morning? The most high. Who, now, who you can, you can, you can, we, we can argue it for the, for the formality me. of your argument. Just walk with me. Who Go causes ahead. everything to grow, the earth to move, uh, the sun to, to keep rotating, all of this motion that we see that we are a benefactors of? The, the most same, high, right? The same one that said to work six days and rest of the Exactly. So again, God is still working, even though he's finished with creation, creating. But guess what? God is still causing these things to what? To operate. So God is still working 365 days of the year and 366 on the leap year. God <laughs> either works on the Sabbath, baby. None of us can get around that. That's what I'm telling you. Okay. So if you if you don't mind, does that mean to you that we are then now free to go and, and clock in occupational labor on the Sabbath day? Is it still a sin to transgress the commandment for the, the Sabbath? Mm, no. Uh, well, OK, you're bringing it back to the law of Moses under the law of Christ. No. Um, but, uh, again, if somebody was to come to me and say, what must I need or what must I do to be saved? Tell me about this man called Jesus. Uh, I, that's work. Evangelizing is work. So and, real quick, and that goes on 365 days of a year. That doesn't stop. Well, you just made, yeah, you made a very, very good point. Right. So Matthew chapter 12, right. Um, Yeshua's, uh, I think that this is, uh, this might be the parallel account. If not, it's a similar one. Okay. So Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse nine, going on from that place, he went into their synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, looking for a reason to bring charges against Yeshua. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The he healing would be a work te technically. Mm -hmm. Right. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Okay. There, therefore, 
Therefore, that's that's a statement of causality. You're initiating a statement of causality, right? If I said the word thus, yeah, Mar uh, Marlo drives a two seater. West Blaze pulled up with four homies. Thus, we took West Blaze van to the bowling alley, right? Mm -hmm. so, OK, so therefore it is lawful. This is the word he used lawful to do good on Shabbat. Now, if this had been a situation based on the context of our dialogue right now, where that man, let's say that he was hungry and, and he didn't have any money or something like that. And he went to work. Let's say he clocked in. He was a receptionist at Blue Cross Blue Shield, whatever. Yeah. And, and they're asking Christ about this dude. OK, well, how come you didn't say nothing to the dude that went and clocked in in his nine to five? Oh, well, you know, it's it's OK for him to work on Shabbat and do his occupational labor. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The context in which Christ is, is defining the term labor or works, it seems very, very, very specific. It's not talking about the things that West Blaze and I are suggesting. I would agree with you that the word work or labor is applicable to any time you're exerting yourself in any fashion, right? So for instance, on the sh on Sabbath, if I make myself a plate of food and I drop it on the ground, am I supposed to leave it there because it's, it's work to go into the pan, you know, go clean it up and get a bit like this is this is the issue that he was having with the Pharisees and scribes how the definitions are of the terms are being used. What is it to be Torah observant? What does it really mean to follow the law of Moses? Are we supposed to end up looking like the Talmudic scribes if we end up keeping the law? Or if I keep the law, should I look like Christ? I argue the latter. Go ahead and uh, respond. I think uh, Wes, our brother Brian got- um, Yeah, his head, uh, his headset died. He's, uh, is I think is he's he back right. on? He just said, I'm here. You can bring him back in the studio, yeah. Okay, okay. I just think that if if the, the instructions change and that under this alleged law of Christ that is somehow maybe different from the law of his father that was already given as the law of Moses, if if that was the case and that now it is no longer a, a sin to transgress the instructions for the Sabbath, which were simply to abstain from occupational labor or causing others to do so. If that were the case, then I'm looking at it, the book of Acts and I'm wondering why is a total of 85 times? Why is it said that? that Paul and the apostles are keeping the Sabbath day. Oh, this let's is, deal no, with that, no. darling. <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Brian. Uh, well, here's my here's my question, and it's very simple. Who determines what is occupation of work on the Sabbath day? Well, it's, I mean, we I can would look say, at the definitions of the words. Go ahead. Yeah, who, yeah who? I would just... I would just say that, that the terms had already been defined. So, so and, when Jesus says for, we have ahead, one brother. rabbi... Who is our instructor then? Well, Christ. Well, and and so Christ we was... have to go with what he says and not what you say, right? Well, the thing is, Bubba. See, right? And I, I, that's well, what let I me, was. Okay. Let, let me just let me answer your question. Okay. Every time I read the Gospels, I put myself in the sandals of a first century Hebrew, and that's why I wanted to make sure that I built my my premise before we started having the discussion, because. If you're in the first century, you don't know if Christ is the Messiah yet. You've got to see everything unfold, especially if you've just been listening to the Pharisees and scribes your whole life. Now, how are you going to know that? Now, you have to have a working knowledge of Torah, of the law and the prophets. And then you have to see if Christ is actually meeting the criterion of what this promise, this promised prophesied Messiah was said to become. Now, if I'm seeing Christ say and do things that run diametrically opposed to the narrative in the Tanakh, then how am I supposed to believe that he's the Messiah? Because he says so? That's what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that Christ met that criterion, and that criterion included that Messiah keeping the law, magnifying the law, as it states in Isaiah. And I, and I agree wholeheartedly okay. we must go by the Old Testament scriptures. So where why did why the question is why did Christ deliberately do stuff on the Sabbath day and triggered the Jews. Why did he do that? Because he was very provocative. And, and that's what I love about Christ. Paul was the same way. Sometimes, sometimes it, and I, I'm trying not to get too philosophical. Sometimes you have to be very blunt and you have to be like, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have everleverlasting life. Is he telling mm -hmm. them to be cannibals? Pluck your yep. eye out, pluck your eye out and cut your hand off if it causes you to sin. Is he saying to yep. maim your body? Yep. Right. Yep. The, 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 the priests desecrate the Sabbath uh, by performing sacrifices and work. Yah commanded that the priest do that, right? So he's he's being very provocative yep. to drive the point home to penetrate through their human traditions that got superimposed on I, top of Torah. I actually I actually enjoy what Christ said personally instead of giving my own opinion. I like to hear what he said. He says 
He says right here in Mark 25, because that's the reason I love context. Everything mm -hmm. that scripture, when you bring out, you have to use the context of it or yeah. you just pick it and choose it. All right, we'll start in verse 23. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. As they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you ever read what David did when he was in need of and was hungry? And he, those were there were who were with him, how they entered the house, God, in thine of Abitha, the high priest, and ate the present bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he also gave it to those who were with him. And he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not for the man of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So he's showing you that how God allowed David to break the law that was about that was only for the priest because he was in need. Where does That's it, the where question does, of the point Brian. is? Go ahead. Jesus is saying these people were hungry. I understand so that. They needed something, so he allowed them to break it. I, well, here's the question. Can you find the Torah, uh, the Torah ordinance regarding the showbread that validates what you just said? Can you also find in First Samuel the account where David does that and give me the dialogue between him and the priest so that we can ascertain what Christ means in context, as you say? Because if all you're going to do is, is, is read the account in the New Testament, right? Without any background information, you might think that you're making a point and it sounds good on the surface. But once we actually go back to look at the account that Christ is tapping into, I believe it, it just sheds all the light that we need to understand what he meant mm -hmm. when he brought that account out. Exactly. Okay, but, so it, but but we agree. We agree in the law. You're not supposed to eat the bread of presence unless you're a priest. Right. Let's well, I, get that out of the way. No, no, no. I'm, that's what so I'm asking. David you. broke the law in the Old Testament. And God allowed him to do it. Brent, Brian, this is what hey, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Whenever you're ready for this verse. Uh, OK, OK. Are you the verse you're bringing out? Are you going to bring out the verse in Leviticus? Uh, actually, the second uh, second Samuel, the, the where it happened. You mean first that's, Samuel? What, that's what Jesus is pointing to. Right, are you, talking there, about, Brian. are you talking about First Samuel twenty one? This is Second Samuel eight uh, through sixteen. Is what is quoting Second Samuel. Just to make sure Second Samuel. You said eight. Make sure, uh, yeah, Second Samuel. Uh, say First Samuel. What twenty one one is that? It's yeah, it's this, first this. it's first Samuel uh, twenty one uh, one through six yeah. is the account. Right. For. And then David came to Nod, Amimelech the priest, and Amimelech came to meet David uh, trembling and said, "Him, why are you alone and no one with you?" And David said to Amimelech the priest, "The king has charged me with the matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you, and with which I charge you." I have made an appointment with young men for such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and mm -hmm. David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us as when I go on ex expedition, these vessels, young men are holy, even when it is ordinary journey. How much more today will these v vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there is no bread but the bread of presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. We know in the Old Testament law, you're not supposed to eat that holy bread, period. Does that, God does it allowed, say that, Brian? That's what Jesus pointed to. But where does it say that, Brian, in the law? Because first off, let me just point out a couple of things. That, Leviticus that jump... 24, 8 and, uh, 8 and 9. Okay, so let's look at that verse. Okay, Leviticus 24. Mm -hmm. 8 and 9. 8 and 9. This bread is to be set before Yah regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in the sanctuary because it is a most holy, uh, it is the most holy part of their perpetual share of the food offerings presented to Yah. 
So okay. you agree that David didn't have a right to eat that bread, but God allowed it. No, I don't agree with that. <laughs> it that's, says it's only for the priest. So, so this David is my, wasn't a priest. He wasn't a Levitical I, priest. I understand that. But this is my question, because this is one of the things that never get brought up. Why did the priest ask David if he had slept with any women? Why does that even matter if he's not supposed to have the bread at all? Well, I mean, then we go go against the law that says only it was only for the Levitical. So this is, but that's I, what I'm, I'm going to stick with what the law says and what God allowed. Well, the law doesn't say that no one else is allowed to eat it. It doesn't say, like. So, for instance, if you read a text, it says this and it shall be for Aaron and his sons. They shall eat it in the holy place since it is for him and a most holy portion of the Lord's food offering a preparation due. So, I yes, it that. does say Leviticals. Well, I, I understand that, but I, I would take you back to First Samuel. The bread had been removed from the presence of Yah and replaced before they ate it. That's one thing. Number two, I still need an answer for that. What significance does sleeping with a woman and being Kodesh have with them even eating the food? Once again, like if it doesn't matter, what's the point in having that, that in is, the text? It, 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 it is in Leviticus 24 that says you're not supposed to do it. So I stick with that. It doesn't say that you're not supposed to do anything. It just says it belongs to Aaron and his sons. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the point was who were there it, when David supposed to do it? Who? The sons, the sons of Aaron were there. The priesthood was there to have that conversation with David. And he gave it to David, which is not lawful. And Jesus pointed it out. Jesus said that it was not lawful. Okay, so he so, pointed out God revised that law and allowed it to happen for David. So that's proof that there is something greater than the law. Okay. Um, real quick, uh, West Blaze, did you want to um, touch on anything that he said, or did you guys want to? I'd, it'd be great to kind of maybe get back on a track that's that's whether you know I don't pertinent more pertinent to whether or not we should be keeping instructions of God. Okay, okay, I'll just add this last little bit, uh, Cherry. If you want to uh, punch in too, that's cool. But um, I, this is what I say, right? When you go throughout the the entire New Testament and you see the words unclean or common or unlawful or lawful, right? It's very, 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 very pertinent that we make sure that we're connecting that word with a specific Torah ordinance. What did Peter say? You know how unlawful it is. Well, we'll a, hold on, real, real quick, Cherry. Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. Um, you know how unlawful it is for a Jew to eat with a Gentile, right? Where does the Torah say that? This is what I'm saying. Like, there's things that were involved in the culture of the Hebrews in the first century that got superimposed or e even intertwined with Torah observance to the degree that it was almost as though they were ordinances themselves. Now, I'm not saying that every single time that we see the word unlawful or unclean or common, that it could be chalked up to Talmudic uh traditions. But that's what I'm saying. What, what's the criterion? We've got to go back to Leviticus. We've got to go back to Exodus. We've got to go back to, in fact, the word, the law, or the term, the law was a colloquialism that was often just talking about the entire Tanakh. John chapter 10, uh, once more, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, right? What does Christ say? Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. He's quoting Psalms. So when you look at the, the preponderance of the Tanakh, I'm looking for, okay, what is Christ talking about here? Where's the law that says that they can't do this or that you can't do this this way? And I just, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see too much merit. I can understand your perspective. I just don't see too much merit in uh, the Pharisees' accusations against him. And I think that that's, that's the point. I mean, they spent their whole career trying to conspire against him and bring him in front of the Sanhedrin for, for, for breaking the law. When people talk about Christ, it's almost like, well, apparently he wasn't making it hard for him. What took them so long to bring them to the Sanhedrin if he was breaking the Sabbath and doing away with the food laws? So th there has to be a more objective disposition to hold that helps someone like me, somebody slow, make sense of it all. Go ahead, Cherry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. So you you kind of collapsed a lot of stuff in, in your statement. But going back to what Brother Brian uh, just said regarding Leviticus uh, 24, 8 and 9, he's absolutely correct. Uh, okay, uh, can I ask this question? Where's the table of showbread located at in the temple? It's right? on the uh, it's on the pure table, right? Inside so, the temple, right? Right until it's removed. Right. So, so again, and who's only allowed in the temple? I ain't talking about the holy of holies, but who's only allowed in the temple? What are you? Nobody, you else about, can go, nobody else can go in there, right? You're talking about the priest, right? The priest, right? Okay. 
So again, the this table of showbread, this bread is only for the priests. Uh, uh, Exodus chapter twenty five verse thirty uh, instructs them to place the uh, uh, the golden table, the tabernacle, uh, the table of showbread, uh, in contribution to the tabernacle, according to Exodus thirty five thirteen. Uh, it is part of the complete tabernacle, and in Exodus thirty nine and thirty six confirms this, and Numbers chapter four con uh, uh, confirms this as well. So again, this the bread i'm just harping on the bread uh right now the bread is definitely for the levitical priesthood and david and nobody else was even allowed to eat that but god allowed him to do that that's what brother brian is pointing out we can click look at the location of what the table of showbread is inside the temple. Nobody else is allowed in there, but who? The Levitical priest. And of course, the chief high priest is only allowed once a year, uh, uh, twice into what? The Holy of Holies. So wait a minute. They're allowing him to eat this. Or should I say God, the most high, is allowing him to eat this. This is uh, considered, according to Leviticus 24, 8 and 9, unlawful. So all these scriptures here confirm that this bread is for the priesthood. No one else, but he got to eat it. And this is why Jesus is bringing this up. Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm aware of all that, right? I've, I've, right. Read the, I've, I've read the account, but there's some very specific things that you would need in the account to be 100%. First off, you guys keep saying, well, the bread was for the priest. The bread was for the priest. I'm the aware of that. I'm aware, but I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm reading it too. What I'm saying is I don't include with that, oh, you better not under any circumstances, even if you're about to throw it away and y'all are fool, you better not give it to nobody, but because it's only for the Levitical priest. In the in the Torah, God is very specific about a lot of things. And he'll say, you can do this, but if this happens, that person is to be put to death. Whatever he's silent on, seemingly to me, is where the Talmudic scribes came in and inserted their traditions in Leviticus chapter 24. Let me go back there. God oh is specific. Leviticus chapter 24, uh, verses eight and nine. God is very specific in the scriptures. He says, yeah, I'll start at verse seven and you shall put pure frankincense on each pile that it may go with the bread as a memorial proportion as food offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons. That's plain speech, darling. And they shall eat it in the holy place since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offering, a perpetual due. So God is very clear here. There's not there. I don't even need no lexicon for this. So it's, what? Ha so what happens when someone, if one of the priests decide that they don't want the bread? What if they're all full and they decided they want to throw it away? He just it, they, they don't eat. But again, he's telling you who the bread is for. I know that. I know that, my love. I'm just saying that there's a nuance that got presented. And that nuance did not break Torah because well, if, it, if the Torah had said, for instance, if the Torah had said that under no circumstances can this bread be given to anybody, whether they're hungry, whatever, this is a holy bread to the most high. It belongs mm -hmm. to him like the Passover lamb, mm -hmm. the Passover lamb for the next day. You couldn't give it to nobody. You couldn't put it in the fridge. It had to be burned. If there was an ordinance with the showbread that sounded like that for someone like me. Right. When I hear uh, your argument and Brian's argument, that's the legitimacy that I would need because I see it in other areas. So when I hear the right. when I hear the Pharisees and scribes. Yeah. And they're establishing their argument. It's not that I don't understand. Of course, it's holy. It came from the pure table. But there's nothing in Torah that says that in the event that the priests want to give it to someone else, that they are prohibited from doing that. Well, that that's, that's again, relevant. again, right here in Leviticus chapter 24, eight and nine, God tells you who this bread is for. I know. Right now, the, after the fact, whether they get full or whatever, God is not scrapping on that. Cause listen, Jesus fed 5,000 and they had leftovers. And Word, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure God, Christ was not, it didn't say that Christ struck them down because they didn't eat all the fish. In fact, they took it off.
wrong. So here's the thing. We, our argument, me and brother Brian, and I believe he'll agree. Our argument where we're pointing out to you, uh, regarding when Jesus brings that up, he's mm -hmm. telling you that this bread was only for the Levitical priests. David was not supposed to eat it, but God allowed him to what? To eat that bread. Our argument is who the bread is for. Mm 